Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, and what a beautiful service it's been so far. I feel like all the music and the scripture and everything that's been used has so pointed to what the message is that I'm speaking about. I want to open with a scripture. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. We have had abortion because of Roe versus Wade for 46 years in our nation. The Supreme Court decided that we could kill children in a mother's womb all the way up until nine months. It's a travesty and a horrible thing. And that brings me to Proverbs 24:11 says, rescue those who are unjustly being sentenced to die. Save them from being led to their slaughter. That scripture so points to the abortion issue to me. Abortion is a sin and it's the shedding of innocent blood. And it has a profoundly affected millions of women and men in our nation. That, quite honestly, is the reason why I am so passionate about this issue and so involved in it. It's because I was personally affected by abortion. Um, I was raised in a home that was very dysfunctional. There was a lot of alcohol and a lot of abuse. And so when I was younger, I just didn't feel like I had any value or any worth. I didn't feel like anyone really loved me. So when I became a teenager, I started looking everywhere for love. And it wasn't long and I was pregnant. And that made me petrified and scared because of the turmoil in my home. I was afraid of my parents. I was afraid to tell them that I was pregnant. And quite honestly, I thought my dad was gonna kill me. And so I went to my boyfriend and asked him, what were we gonna do? And he said, I do not want a baby. That's the last thing I want. You are gonna have to get an abortion. And if you don't, I'm just gonna leave you and you're gonna be left to raise that child by yourself. And that brought me into even more fear because I didn't have a clue how me being a teenager, I was gonna do this. So all of those fears started pressing into me and I listened to them and I made an appointment, an abortion facility. My boyfriend and I drove about an hour and a half away to that facility and when we got there, they put me in a room by myself with the nurse and they began to tell me that this was not a baby at all. It was just a clump of cells, a blob of tissue. They told me that this surgical procedure was going to be safe. It was gonna be easy, it was gonna be quick. In fact, they told me that it would be safer than if I carried my baby to term. They didn't tell me about fetal development. They told me it was just a blob. They didn't tell me about the procedure that I'd have or the risks of this surgical procedure. They were the adults, the medical professionals, and I was a scared teenager. So of course I believed what they had to say. And in fact, I wanted to hear what they had to say because I was so scared. So I paid my money and I went ahead with the abortion that day. You know, women are still being told today at Planned Parenthood that it's just a blob of tissue. They're still being told that this is a safe procedure, safer than carrying your baby to turn. And in fact, Planned Parenthood's policy is if it is um, legal, required by law, to have a sonogram or an ultrasound, they will turn that screen away from the woman so she will not see her baby because they know if she sees that child, she probably will not abort. Most abortions are done in the first trimester at 10 or 12 weeks of pregnancy. Um, I just kind of want to run through some quick milestones of that development in those first nine to 10 weeks. At day 19, the heart is beating already. At day 42, there are brain waves present and there's thinking taking place within that baby. At day 49, the skeletal system is being developed, complete fingers and toes and ears. And then at day 56, all the organs, the stomach, the kidneys, the liver, the brain, it's all developed and functioning. And at nine to 10 weeks, the teeth are forming and fingernails are even being developed at that point. That baby's squinting and retracting its tongue. Pretty much at nine to 10 weeks, that baby is formed, it just needs to grow. That was the time 
of my abortion, nine to 10 weeks. Does that sound like just a blob of tissue to you? No. My baby was a baby. You know, I laid on that cold table that day waiting for a doctor to come in to perform a surgical abortion procedure on me and my parents didn't even know I was there that day. I had what was called the vacuum aspirator abortion. It's the most common abortion procedure done in the first trimester that's surgical. I was given no anesthetic for the pain whatsoever. They told me that I just feel a little cramping, a little tugging sensation. The pain was almost unbearable. My whole body shook from the, va the suction and the tugging of that machine. I grabbed hold of the sides of the tables just to steady myself and hold myself on the table. I could hear the labor of that suction machine when pieces and parts of my baby were going through the tubing because that's what a vacuum aspirator method is. It's, it's literally where they suction that baby limb by limb from that mother's womb. There was a glass jar to the right of my head and I kept trying to lift up and look to see what was in that jar because it looked like it was more than just a blob of tissue. But the nurse kept pushing me back down and telling me I needed to lay still. But I had to see. And then she held me back with even more force. As soon as the procedure was over with, she wheeled the jar out of the room, shielding it with her body so that I wouldn't be able to see what was in that jar. Then I was told that I could get dressed and I could go to this other room and I could have juice and cookies and in 40 minutes, if I felt okay, I could go home. And I just wanted to get out of there. I didn't feel well, but I wanted out. The drive home was very silent and quiet. And I laid in the back seat of the car in so much pain and I was bleeding profusely. So much so that when we did arrive back to my home, I called the abortion facility to tell them about my dilemma. Their response to me was, I'm sorry, but you're no longer a problem. You're going to have to call your own doctor. And they hung up the phone. And I was in shock. I thought the last thing I'm going to do is call my doctor because I was so ashamed of what I had done. I didn't want anyone to know. So I didn't call my doctor. I laid there that night and I did not know if I would bleed to death. And part of me felt like I probably deserved to because of what I had done. A part of me did die that day. I was never the same. I was filled with an awful lot of anger, with shame, with guilt, depression, and I didn't know what to do with any of it. And so because of all of it, I started drinking and doing drugs just to numb the pain, just to feel better. My boyfriend and I broke up very quickly because every time I looked at him, I saw the abortion. I saw someone who didn't protect me or protect our baby. Very common in abortions. 85% of couples will break up after an abortion. You know, I hated myself so much for what I had done, I became very promiscuous because I thought the only way someone would love me is if I gave myself to them or gave them something in return. So because of that lifestyle, I became pregnant two more times and had abortion two more times. By the third abortion, I was so filled with so much shame and guilt that when I went into the abortion facility, I did not even give them my right name. I gave them a friend's name. No one asked for an ID. What if there would have been a complication that day? What if I would have died on the table that day? Who would they have called? What would they have done? Would I just be a missing person today? I don't know that. You know, Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred or hopelessness, it makes our heart sick. But dreams that are fulfilled are a tree of life. That's exactly where I was. I was absolutely hopeless and I didn't even have a dream. I didn't even know how to dream. But God had a plan for my life. Both of my parents, my mom and dad, came to know the Lord and through their witness and their loving testimony, they began to talk to me about Jesus Christ and I received Jesus into my heart 
and my life was literally transformed. I quit drinking, quit doing drugs, and I began to serve the Lord, got very involved in my church, and I met a man, and he was a man who loved me for who I was and not for what he could get from me. And we were married a couple years later. We both had great jobs. We were going to a great church. We were very involved in our church. We bought a house, and we thought, let's start a family. Everything just seemed so wonderful. So we started trying, but we were having absolutely no success. So I went to the doctor to see what the issue was. And what I was told after all the tests were done was that because of the abortions I had, it destroyed my tubes in my uterus and I was infertile. And I literally had to live with the reality that I killed the only children that I would ever bear. It was quite devastating and it was a very hard thing to walk through. I remember as I found that information out, trying to figure out how am I gonna tell my husband about this? Would he leave me or would he stay with me? And how was I gonna tell him because of the sins of my past, he was not gonna be able to have any of his own biological children? I so hoped that he didn't leave me, but my husband was such a man of God that he said, we will work through this. And through a lot of prayer, we decided to adopt a little boy from India. But this process of working through all of this and the healing was not an easy process at all. We went through a lot of hardship, a lot of tears, a lot of pain a lot of healing between the two of us. I mean, I remember many nights that I couldn't even sleep because I just could not forgive myself. And I would just rock and, and cry at night and my husband would hold me and he would just keep telling me, I forgive you, God loves you. But it was so hard to reconcile that with, I killed three children. How could God forgive me for this? It was hard for me to actually reconcile that within myself once I learned what abortion was and what I had done. You know, the sins of my past affected not just me, but affected my whole family. My parents had grandchildren they were never gonna hold. My sisters and my brother had nieces and nephews they were never going to meet. Those abortions still affect me today. I'd probably have grandchildren today and I would have had great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. And I think you can see where I'm going with this. We as a nation are not just killing millions of children, but we are killing off generations. I literally destroyed my family tree. It, it was quite a hard thing to really get through. You know, it is difficult many times for us to know the consequence of our sin and the cost of it. And there are lots of tears that we have to shed and, and repentance and sorrow that we have to go through so that we can be healed. But healing did come and God did show me that this wasn't the unforgivable sin, that he could forgive me for it. But it came through prayer. It came for, through getting into the word of God, learning what does God say about abortion? What does he say about me? What is that plan and that purpose? It also came through Bible studies, going through post-abortion healing, but also through speaking out. Once I could get through that and forgive myself, I learned about Revelations 12, 11, that says by the, they will overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony if they love not their life unto death. I began to speak out and share what those abortions had done to me because I didn't want to see other women have to go through the same thing and I wanted to see women who had gone through it know that there was forgiveness and healing. I also am very involved in a ministry called the Operation Outcry. It is a ministry of men and women who like myself, we speak out. We speak out in churches and in youth groups and anywhere, schools, anywhere that they will have us so we can tell about the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also about his healing. 
part of Operation Outcry is the Justice Foundation is the ministry over it. It's a legal effort to overturn Roe versus Wade in our nation. And these declarations that are beside me, these are only part of them. There's, there's like hundreds of thousands. I usually take about 4,500 with me just so people can get like a visual. Um, effort. These are declarations, they're pages, stacks of pages, they're legal documents. These have been used in many cases at the Supreme Court, but even at different state levels. These were used as evidence um, when partial birth abortion was banned in the United States. These were also used in the state of Iowa last year when we heard the heartbeat bill. They were as admitted into evidence as to the pain and sorrow of abortion. I also had the great honor of taking these with me to the um, federal government as we had a judicial hearing to defund Planned Parenthood and I was able to give testimony and bring these with me because in these, each one of these pages represents either one man or one woman's story of how they were hurt by abortion. See, it wasn't just me. And if you're out there today and you're hurting from an abortion, it's not just you. You're not the only one feeling the feelings that you're having. There has been 61 million abortions done in our nation today. That's an awful lot of hurting people. So these are testimony of people who have been hurt. Some of the stories in these pages are absolutely heart-wrenching. There are stories of young ladies who were forced to stay in a Planned Parenthood until they agreed to have an abortion they didn't want. There's many stories of women who were forced by a parent, a boyfriend, a trafficker, a parent, to have an abortion when they wanted to keep their child. There is a story of a woman in here whose daughter died on the abortionist table. There's also a story in there of a woman who was repeatedly raped by an uncle and her father forced her to abort her twins because he wanted to cover up the crime. He didn't want to see his brother go off to prison. And her testimony is that the abortion was far worse than the rapes ever were. So the stories are horrific. This is not health care. And abortion isn't good for women. It is not. You know, like I said, over 61 million abortions in our nation, that's a lot of hurting men and hurting women. One in three women have been hurt by abortion and, and have, been, have had abortions. One in three, that's a huge number. That's a huge statistic. 65% of those women say that they were coerced by a parent, a boyfriend, a husband. That means one in eight women have been forced to have an abortion. That doesn't sound like choice to me. You know, 80% of post-abortive women will experience some sort of level of traumatic response from their abortion. And so I just want to kind of go through a list of some of those symptoms. Like I said, if there are one in three of us, statistics show that probably in this room, I'm not the only one that is hurting from an abortion. There may be some of you in this room that you've had symptoms or responses from that abortion, but you don't even know that the, that the abortion is the reason for that response or that symptom. So I kind of want to go through this list so you can ask yourself, is that why I feel this way? Is that why I'm going through that? Many of the women will go through drug or alcohol abuse. They'll have an eating disorder. They'll not be able to bond with their living children, the children that are here now, or maybe their future children. They will get depression on the anniversary date of when the child was supposed to be born or on the date of when they had their abortion. They won't be able to make decisions. And many times that's because that decision that they made about the abortion was a bad decision. So they just don't want to make any. They may find themselves in promiscuous behavior like what I was because subconsciously, we are told that this is an okay, this is a right, this is legal, but no one tells us because it's wrong, we have to grieve the loss of that child. And so subconsciously, a woman is trying to replace that baby. So that's why many times, if, if they choose abortion once, there will be repeat abortions. Fear of holding other people's children or your own child. Fear of a vacuum cleaner, the sound of it. 86% will have 
anger and rage, and 56% will develop suicidal feelings. 86% will fear that someone else might find out what they've done. They may, that woman may have panic attacks or anxiety. And 53% will engage in drug abuse. All of these fears and the avenues of destructions can last a lifetime unless, unless she receives healing and the forgiveness that is needed to come into freedom. We have a real crisis in our na nation, spiritually and naturally. And because of those statistics, some of you women may be here today. But what I want to tell you is if that is you and you've had an abortion, or if there's abortion in your family, or maybe you're even a man who has encouraged a woman to have an abortion, what I want to tell you today is God loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love, and there is forgiveness available. If you will repent and tell him you're sorry, there's forgiveness. He's quick to forgive. Do you know the word says that he died for us even when we were yet in our sin? That's how much he loves us. He doesn't just throw us away after we've sinned. He still loves us and wants us to come to him. You know, Psalms 103, 12 says, he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. And the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Hebrews 8, 12 says that, I will never again remember their sins. So my heart's cry is to you today, if you are carrying the secret of abortion, this is a safe place today to lay down that secret, to come and tell me about that secret. I'm familiar with it. I carried that secret for so many years. You know, I teach a Bible study um, on forgiveness, and a few classes ago, <clears throat> we had a woman who had spoken at church in January, and she, for over 27 years, she lived with her secret and did nothing about it. And so she heard me speak at her church and she called me, she took one of my cards and called me and we talked. And she went through the abortion recovery. And when she was finished, she, her whole countenance had changed. And part of her testimony was, I wish I would have done this so many years ago. I lived through all of these symptoms for over 25 years. She was seeing a counselor for the last 10 years. And three weeks after the Bible study, her counselor said, I don't think you're gonna need to come back because God wants to heal and forgive. You know, I think about Psalms 139, and it talks about how God knit us together in our mother's womb, and he had a plan and a purpose for us. He knew everything about us before we were even born. He knew what we would do before we lived one day. Most of you probably know that scripture, but here's the thing. When we're broken and we're hurting inside, hurt people will hurt other people. But healed people will help restore other people. So when we find freedom, when we find healing, when we find forgiveness, we are able to walk in that love and that forgiveness and to walk in the very purpose and the plan God had for our life. So the Lord wants you to come into the very plan he has. You don't have to live in brokenness or any hurt anymore. I just wanna kinda close there right now and um, remind you that in the back are books and they're free for you to take, but also on that table, there's gonna be cards, my business card. There may be somebody here today that just, you just can't find the courage to come forward. I want you to take my card and I want you to either call me, email me, text me, whatever is most comfortable for you, but let's get together and have coffee and let's talk because God wants you to be everything he's created you to be. He truly does. And then I wanna remind you, like Pastor Christina said, they're making available today an opportunity to come to a room, the fireside room, and let's talk. Let's go through the first steps of healing so you can get on this journey and this path of what God has for you. Your pastor loves you that much, and she cares about you that much. She wants your freedom. She wants you restored to be everything God planned and purposed for you to be. So thank you all for being here today, for listening. And I pray, I pray for each one of you. In fact, can I just pray for you right now? Lord, I pray for each one that's here today, that Father, you release the spirit of freedom and forgiveness and love 
that, Father, you destroy any yokes of shame or guilt that would be over anyone in this room today. And Lord, if there's people hurting here because their child has had an abortion and they're, they're missing a grandchild, if a sibling has had an abortion and they're missing a niece or nephew, Lord, I pray that your precious blood will just wash over them and wash them clean and that, Lord, you'll bring that forgiveness that's necessary and needed and that, Lord, you'll reveal your love and your kindness towards them today. And Lord, I just know that's who you are. You're a compassionate God. You love us, you forgive us, and you restore us. So I thank you that you'll do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.